It's an honor for me to be here. Uh, and thank you all for joining us. And thank you for the invitations uh, from the political parties. Um, I, I want to use my time with you to speak directly and practically to the extraordinary impasse that we clearly face as a civilization. We are at 1.2 degrees of global warming, and already the effects are clearly disastrous. Devastating planetary changes are playing out before us in real time. It is critically important that we make every effort to limit global warming to as close to 1.5 degrees as possible in line with the Paris Agreement. Scientists warn that pushing beyond this level towards two degrees is likely to trigger several major tipping points in the Earth system, and beyond this level, we will not be able to adapt. Yes, over the past decade, the EU has reduced its emissions. Some politicians have hailed this as evidence of green growth. But remember, when it comes to climate mitigation, what matters is speed. We must reduce emissions fast enough to stay within fair shares of the carbon budget for 1.5 degrees. For high-income countries, this is extremely challenging because they have very high levels of energy use. Uh, and high energy use makes sufficiently rapid decarbonization very difficult to achieve. The EU is not on track to meet its Paris obligations. Not even close. At existing rates of mitigation, it will take several hundred years to cut emissions to zero. Even if the Green Deal brings everyone to the speed of the best performing countries, Denmark and the Netherlands, the EU will still blow its fair share of the carbon budget many times over. There's nothing green about this. It's a recipe for disaster. Much faster mitigation is needed. And climate is not the only crisis that we face. We're also overshooting five other planetary boundaries, including staggering rates of biodiversity loss, driven mainly by excess material use in the world economy. And here again, it's the high-income countries, which have disproportionately high levels of material use, which are overwhelmingly responsible for driving this crisis. What's more, the constant hunt for capitalist growth in the EU and other high-income economies relies on a constant plunder of goods and resources and labor from the Global South. Input-output data shows that consumption in rich countries, uh, about half of all of material consumption in rich countries is net appropriated from the Global South through unequal exchange. This drains poorer countries of wealth that could be used for development. It colonizes their lands. It produces global inequality. And it means the social and ecological costs of growth are externalized to vulnerable communities. <laughs> This arrangement is wildly destructive and wildly unjust. The science is very clear. Rich countries must substantially reduce their use of energy and materials so that we can decarbonize fast enough uh, to stay under 1.5 degrees, so that we can reverse other forms of ecological breakdown, and to release the global south from the grip of neocolonial extraction. But this brings us to a paradox. Europe has extremely high levels of energy and material use, vastly overshooting planetary boundaries, and yet nonetheless still fails to meet many basic human needs. 40 million people cannot access nutritious food and cannot heat their homes. 95 million people face the risk of poverty. Tens of millions more cannot access decent housing. Why? It's because our economic system is fundamentally undemocratic. Our productive capacities are controlled by capital and mobilized around what is profitable to capital rather than what is necessary for human well-being and ecology. So we end up with perverse forms of production, SUVs and fast fashion and fossil fuels and advertising instead of public transit, nutritious food, renewable energy, affordable housing. Our economic system fails in both ecological and social terms. So we face a double challenge. We need to transition to an economy that meets human needs and achieves social progress, while also substantially reducing energy and material use. <laughs> 
some of this can be achieved through efficiency improvements, yes, and we should embrace the power of technological change. But we also know that this is not enough in and of itself. In a growth-oriented economy, gains from efficiency are diminished by the scale effects of ever-increasing production. If we are to overcome this problem and achieve our ecological goals, we need to transition to a post-growth economy and reorganize production around well-being and ecology. The first step is clear. We must abandon GDP growth as an objective. Simon Kuznets, the man who invented the GDP metric himself, warned that it should never be used as a measure of economic and social progress. It does not distinguish between what is good and what is harmful, and it does not account for social and ecological costs. We urgently need alternative indicators, but please do not walk away from this conference believing that this is all that needs to be done. If you are speeding toward a cliff, it is not enough to simply fiddle with the speedometer in your car. You have to deal with the underlying problem. Think about it this way. The dominant assumption in economics right now is that every industry must increase production every year, regardless of how destructive it is and regardless of whether or not we actually need it. This is an irrational way to run an economy at the best of times. In the middle of an ecological emergency, it is clearly madness. Instead, we need to determine democratically what kinds of production we need to be doing and what kinds of production are clearly destructive and should be scaled down. This focuses the mind. Empirical research shows that the single most powerful way to improve well-being and social outcomes is to expand and decommodify universal public services. And by <laughs> and by this I mean healthcare and education, yes, but also housing, public transit, energy, water, internet, nutritious food for all. High quality universal services should be a core objective of EU policy. Let us mobilize our productive forces to ensure that everyone can access what is necessary to live a decent life. In addition, we must invest in ambitious public works programs to build renewable energy, improve public transit, insulate homes, install efficient appliances, restore ecosystems. These are urgent, socially necessary tasks, and we cannot just wait around for capital to decide they are worth doing. We must mobilize to do them directly and fast, harnessing the power of public finance and industrial policy. Such a program can and should also include a job guarantee, empowering people to train and participate in the most important collective projects of our generation, doing dignified, meaningful, socially valuable work with workplace democracy and living wages. <laughs> Think about the power of this approach. It allows us to achieve ecological objectives, but it also abolishes unemployment, something that growth never does. It abolishes economic security, which growth never does. It ensures good lives for all, regardless of fluctuations in aggregate output. This liberates us from growth imperatives and stabilizes the economy. Now, as we improve and secure the socially necessary sectors, the social foundation, we also need to scale down socially less necessary forms of production. Fossil fuels are the obvious one here. We need binding targets to wind this industry down. But, but we also need to reduce production of private jets, SUVs, commercial airlines, mansions, industrial beef, fast fashion, advertising, arms, cruise ships. There are huge chunks of our economy that are mostly organized around capital accumulation and are wasteful and destructive and totally irrelevant to human well-being. We can also ban the practice of planned obsolescence and introduce policy to extend product lifespans. If our products last twice as long, we will need half as many. Finally, we urgently need to cut the purchasing power of the rich using basic, sensible policy tools such as wealth taxes and maximum income ratios. Recent research... Recent research shows that millionaires alone are on track to burn 72% of the remaining carbon budget for 1.5 degrees. This is an egregious assault on humanity and the living world, and none of us should accept it. 
We need to realize that it is irrational and unjust for us to continue devoting our energy and resources to supporting an overconsuming elite in the middle of a climate emergency. Policies like these would dramatically reduce energy and material use, allowing us to achieve rapid decarbonization while at the same time improving social outcomes. And if we find that our society requires less labor to produce the things that we need, we can shorten the working week, give people more free time, and share necessary labor more evenly, thus permanently preventing any unemployment. Unemployment is an artificial scarcity, and it can be abolished. Is it affordable? Yes. By definition, yes. As Keynes pointed out, anything we can actually do, we can afford. In terms of productive, uh, productive capacity, we can pay for it. And when it comes to productive capacity, we have far more than enough. Deploying public finances and industrial policy simply shifts this capacity away from wasteful production and elite accumulation to achieve democratically ratified social and ecological objectives. Some will say this sounds utopian, but the policies I've mentioned here happen to be extremely popular. Universal public services, a public job guarantee, more equality, an economy focused on well-being and ecology rather than growth, polls and surveys show strong majority support for these ideas, and official citizens' assemblies in several European countries have called for precisely this kind of transition. A post-growth deal along these lines can be a popular and feasible political agenda. But Europe is not an island. Addressing our global crises requires that all countries succeed or none of us do. Governments in the global south also need the freedom to mobilize their own production around human needs and ecological objectives, rather than servicing consumption and accumulation in the global north. This requires... <laughs> This requires reversing IMF structural adjustment programs, cancelling unpayable debts, and ending unequal exchange. None of this will happen on its own. It will require a major political struggle against those who profit so prodigiously from the status quo. To get there, we must build alliances between environmentalists and labor movements and other progressive political formations. This is not a time for timid responses, tweaking around the edges of an obviously failing system. This is a time for courage. Is there hope? Yes. But our hope can only ever be as strong as our struggle. So build the struggle. Focus on the future we need. Adjust an ecological economy for the 21st century. Thank you.